Oh, hey, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you happen to be. Welcome to T4S TV. Um, I'm HBS Solo Lucky Star, and uh, today is, let's see, Tuesday, May 31st, 2022. Can you believe May is almost over? Oh my goodness. So um, we, because it's Tuesday, we've been working on, working our way through this book, which is entitled um, 120 Days of Sodom. You might wonder and ask, you know, why are you reading that, right? Well, it's actually a really good analogy of what can happen to people when they hand their sovereignty, their personal sovereignty, you know, over to a tyrant and the lengths to which these tyrants will go in terms of like mistreating you, your kids. Um, there's definitely a lot of child abuse that happens in this book and it's really horrible. Um, However, I, I think it kind of echoes in today, doesn't it? You know, I mean, I'll leave it at that. But I think you know what I mean. <laughs> All right. So we're just going to pick right back up where we left off, which was um, on page 165. And you can read along with me. I've left a link in the description. If you want, you can read with me. All right, so we're just going to get going here. Um, the guests arrived. Let me just pull this over a bit so I can see what's happening here. Uh, let me arrange this on my desktop a little bit better so I can see. Okay. The guests arrived. The first was an elderly parliamentarian in his 60s named De Urville. His mistress, a woman of 40, exceedingly handsome and having no visu visible defect other than certain excess of flesh. Her name was Madame de Cange. The second was a retired military officer between 45 and 50, and he was called Dupree. His mistress, an attractive young person of 26, blonde, having as lovely a body as you may hope to find. Her name was Marianne. The third was an abbot, 60 years old. Du Caudray by name. His mistress was a lad of a lad of sixteen, pretty as a star, whom the good ecclesiastic passed off as his nephew. The table was laid in that part of the house near my chambers. The meal was festive, a fair delicate, and I remarked that the young lady and the youth were on a diet very similar to mine. Characters declared themselves while we dined. It was impossible to be more a libertine than D. Urville. His eyes, his speech, his gestures, everything about him proclaimed debauchery. Libertinage was painted in his every line. There was more of the restrained, the deliberate and Dupree, but lust was nonetheless the soul of his existence. As for the abbot, he was the world's most errant, boldest atheist. Blasphemies flew from his lips with virtually every word he pronounced. With regard to the ladies, they emulated their lovers, tattled and chattered a blue streak, but in a rather agreeable tone. The young boy struck me as being as great a fool as he was a pretty one, and Ducange, who seemed smitten by him, cast a series of tender glances toward him, every one of which he failed to even notice. All propriety had vanished by the time dessert arrived and the conversation had become as filthy as the goings on. Deerville congratulated Diacourt upon his latest acquisition and begged to know whether my ass had any merit oh God, and if I shitted pleasantly. <laughs> oh, by God, my capitalist replied with a smile, you've only to establish the facts for yourself. We hold our goods in common, you know, and lend one another our mistresses quite as willingly as we do our purses. Why, Deerville murmured, I believe I will have a peek. <sighs> Taking me by the hand at once. Um, so at this point in the book, this person who's been doing all this narrating um, is now about like 22 or something years old. Okay, so we're not <clears throat> we're not talking about a child, but um, you know she was sold out at a very young age and turned out by her own sister and never had any good examples in her life, never had any um, guidance or anything 
or any real teaching, you know, and uh, yeah, ended up in the whorehouse when she was like, I'm going to say 12. I can't remember the exact age, but uh, yeah. So anyway, she just recently um, was basically tempted into an even worse position than she was in the brothel. So now, now this guy has lured her away with some um, diamonds and a nice place to live and so on. Oh, oh, hi, Owen. Hey, Owen, how are you? It's nice to see you. So Owen says, hey, Zola, oh, no, not this book again. Laugh out loud. Joke. It's good to be aware of this kind of stuff. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's that day. It's that time again. We're back to this. Um, how am I doing? Yeah, I'm doing pretty good. Yep. Um, yeah, ah, this is horrible. Okay. I'm glad to see you. Thanks for coming in. I really appreciate, you know, your support and being here. Um, and HP Black Mamba is not going to be here for a while, actually. Um, yes, there's been this ongoing um, power thing, right? But uh, he's taking a few months off to focus on his book, which he really wants to get out as soon as possible. And it's just been too much, like trying to do everything, right? So I'm going to be continuing on with the live streams by myself for a while. So yeah. Uh, anyway, let's go on with this. Uh, do, 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 do. Why, I believe I will have a peek. Taking me by the hand at once, he proposed that we repair to a closet together. As I was hesitating, Dukanj raised her brows <clears throat> and said in a rude voice, Be off with you, mademoiselle. We don't stand on ceremony here. I'll look after your lover while you're away. Owen says, yes, he came to the forum, forum and said he might be taking a three-month break. Yeah, um, it's a, it's like the first book was, um, I don't know, like it was more pragmatic and sort of straightforward, but this one, he's got to go really deep and it's just taking a lot of energy and time. So that's what's happening there. Um, so we're looking forward to seeing that definitely in print. And that'll be exciting to see. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm filling in for a while on my own. And um, I am going to make a stab at the Friday Tarot for sure this Friday now. I actually, last Friday, I was supposed to do it. I was going to take a stab at it. But uh, my power got shut off. <laughs> yeah, they were doing some work around my building and they shut the damn power off. And I was like, okay. <laughs> A sign from the universe not to start just yet um, and d a court whose eyes i consulted having made a sign of approbation i followed the old legislator tis he messieurs and the other two as well who are going to offer you the three demonstrations of the taste we are currently studying which should compose the better part of today's narrations oh no <laughs> As soon as I was closeted with D. Irville, so hard to read, he, very much warmed by the drink he'd imbibed, kissed me upon the mouth with extreme enthusiasm and in doing so belched a few hiccups into my mouth, which nearly made me eject from that orifice what a few minutes later he seemed to have the most pressing desire to see emerge from another. So she almost vomited. <laughs> my God. He lifted my skirts, examined my behind with all the libricity of a consummate libertine, then informed me he was not at all surprised at de Accord's choice. For indeed, said he, I had one of the most beautiful asses in Paris. He besought me to commence with a few farts. And then after he had absconded, or sorry, he had absorbed a half dozen of them. That's so gross. He then returned to kissing my mouth the while fondling me and vigorously spreading my buttocks. Are you beginning to feel the need? He asked. I feel little else. Very well, my pretty child, be so good as to shit upon this dish. <laughs> oh my. 
He brought with him one of white, you know, I don't know. Seriously, I don't know what it is with the, these people's fetish. <sighs> he brought with him one of white porcelain. He held it while I pushed and scrupul scrupulously examined the turd as it emerged. A delicious spectacle, which he so he maintained, intoxicated him with pleasure. When I finished, he picked up the plate, ecstatically inhaled the voluptuous product it contained, handled, kissed, sniffed the turd, then telling me he could bear it no longer and that it was now lust wherewith he was drunk thanks to this, the most sublime piece of shit he'd ever seen. He bade me suck his prick, although there was nothing in any way agreeable about this operation, fear of de-angering the court by not cooperating with his friend, induced me to accede to everything. He settled himself in an armchair, or rather sprawled sideways in it. <laughs> Owen says they really do have weird fetishes, don't they? <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know, this whole thing, okay, you know, where it's saying, you know, that he had her... Um, shit on this white porcelain and there is a video and i've seen it online um or was it photos anyways it might have been a series of photos but at any rate you know um it's like this grouping of people you know and they're obviously very elite you know um and it's like in some masonic lodge or somewhere you know what i mean like it's very ceremonial looking and this this naked person sitting on the floor and in front of her is a white porcelain dish with a fucking turd on it and obviously like i don't know i guess the guy standing over her had just deposited it there and then she's expected to fucking eat it which is just disgusting but um anyway so it just makes me wonder like you know this is supposedly a work of fiction but i don't know i think that there's a lot of i think it's a way of putting the truth out there and laughing in people's faces and yet there is a plausible deniability so if somebody confronted them and said this kind of stuff really is going on behind closed doors they can go oh please that's just fiction you know it's kind of like they hide behind um cutting edge artistry nowadays right um you're seeing like a lot of incredibly strange grotesque stuff that is being put into like fashion shows for example Oh my gosh, I've been slowly collecting some images that eventually I wanted to kind of write about, but, and, um, you know, they can hide behind, oh, you know, it's just like artistic expression. Same kind of deal, right? They're, they're, they're showing people something, but at the same time, there's this plausible deniability because they haven't come right out and really clearly stated like, yes, we're doing this and this is what we're doing. You know, but it's it's like there's this need to kind of reveal what what is really going on. So I guess that, you know, in their minds, we can say they can say, well, you know, they knew and they still said, OK. But it's very roundabout way of doing it. Like, I mean, people don't know. Most people don't know. You know, <laughs> they don't know. So I don't think it's an incredibly fair way of come, going about things. Um, he settled himself in an armchair or rather sprawled sideways in it having deposited the plate on a neighboring table upon which he also rested half his body his nose buried in the shit Ugh. he extended his legs and I having drawn up a low chair and having pulled from his fly a mere suspicion of a very soft prick instead of a real member despite my repugnance I fell to sucking this miserable relic, hoping that a mouthing would give it at least a little consistency. It did not. Once I'd taken the wretched object into my mouth, the libertine started his operation and thrust into his the pretty little egg, all bright and new, that I had just laid for him. He didn't eat it. He battened on it. The game lasted for three minutes, during which his squirmings, shudderings, contortions declared a very ardent and a very expressive delight but it was all in vain not a trace of solidity appeared in that ugly little stub of a tool which after having <clears throat> wept tears of chagrin into my mouth <coughs> it 
withdrew itself more shame than ever and left its master in that prostration, in that abandon, in that exhaustion, which is a certain consequence of a potent draught of pleasure. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> ah, said the parliamentarian, I forswear my faith. Never have I seen anyone shit like that. It's a good thing I haven't eaten yet this morning. Upon returning to the dining room, we found only the abbot and his nephew, and as they were operating, I can give you the essential particulars at once. Whereas the others exchanged mistresses in this little society, nothing could induce Du Caudray to do so. Always content with what he had, he never accepted a substitute for it. He would not have been able, I was informed, to amuse himself with a woman, but in every other respect, he and Du Ocourt were alike. He went his, about his ceremony in the same way. What was more, when we'd entered the room, the youngster, <laughs> oh, and saying, what the fuck is with this shit thing? <laughs> I keep hoping we'll go on to something else. <laughs> so far, it's just like more of this. <sighs> when we entered the room, the youngster... <laughs> Oh, it says I'm actually eating right now. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't eat and read this, I'll tell you. Um, and when we entered the room, the youngster was lying belly down upon the edge of the divan, presenting his ass to his dear uncle. Oh, so um, what do you call that? It's not just pedophilia. It's... Um, what is that when you're when you're screwing your sister kind of thing? I can't think of the word right now. <laughs> uh, let's see. Ugh. Was lovingly receiving into his mouth and steadily consuming all the lad was producing. Ugh. The while frigging an exceedingly small prick we observed dangling between his thighs, the abbot discharged our presence notwithstanding and swore that the boy was shitting better with every day that passed. <sighs> Ew. Owen says <clears throat> inbred. Yeah, but what what what's the word for when you are screwing a family member? I can't think of In incest. Yeah, incest. <laughs> Marianne and D. Accord, who were amusing themselves together, soon reappeared and were followed by Dupree and du Ducange, who they said had only been cuddling and volleying while waiting for me. Because, said Dupree, she and I are old acquaintances, whereas you, my lovely queen, you whom I, seem, whom I see for the first time, inspire in me the most ardent desire for a more thorough amusement. But, I objected, Monsieur de Urville has taken it all. I have nothing left to offer you. Why, indeed... He said with a merry laugh, indeed, I ask nothing from you. I'll furnish all that is needed. I merely require your fingers. Ew. <laughs> Curious to learn the meaning of this enigma. I don't want to learn the, <laughs> I don't want to know. <laughs> I accompany him and as soon as we're alone together, he asks to kiss my ass for a brief minute. I raise it toward him, and after two or three licks and sucks at the hole, he unbuttons his breeches and bids me do unto him what he's just done on my behalf. Ew. His posture excited my suspicions. He was seated facing the back of a chair by clinging to which he kept his balance, and beneath him was a pot waiting to be filled. And so observing... He was ready to perform all by himself. I asked why it was necessary for me to kiss his ass. No. Nothing could be more necessary in my heart, he replied, for my ass in all of France, the most capricious of asses, never shits save when kissed. I obeyed but took care to stay clear of danger, perceiving my cautious maneuvering, Closer, for God's sake. Get closer, sweetie. Are you afraid of a little shit? Uh, 
Oh no, I don't want to read this. <sighs> and so at last, in order to be friendly, I brought my lips to the vicinity of the hole, but he no sooner felt them there than he tripped the spring. The eruption was so violent, one of my cheeks was splashed from temple to chin. He needed but one shot to submerge the plate. Never in my life had I seen such a turd. All by itself, it would easily have filled a very deep salad bowl. <laughs> oh my God. Oh no. Our man snatches it up, takes it with him, and lies down on the edge of the bed, presents his entirely beshitted ass, and orders me to play with it while he feasts upon what has just darted out of his entrails. Filthy as this bomb was, I had to obey. His mistress doubtless does as much. I said to myself, I must be as obliging as she. Oh my goodness. I plunge three fingers into the murky aperture, pleading for my attentions. Our man is beside himself with joy. He falls upon his own excrement, daubs his face with it, wallows in it, feeds upon it. One of his hands holds the plate. The other jostles his prick, rising up majestically between his thighs. I redouble my efforts. They are not in vain. I feel his anus contract around my fingers. This reports that his erector muscles are about to launch the seed. The prospect delights me. The plate is licked clean and my partner discharges. <sighs> oh, I'm saying that's so messed up. I'll say. <sighs> Once again, back in the salon, I find my inconstant D a court with the lovely Marianne. The rascal has also made use of her. The only one who remains is the page boy with whom I believe he might also have come to terms had the jealous abbot only consented to relinquish him for half an hour. When everyone had returned, they all spoke of removing their clothes and of performing a few extravagances in front of each other. The idea struck me as excellent for it would enable me to see Marianne's body, which I had the greatest desire to examine. It proved delicious, firm, fair, splendidly proportioned, and her ass, which I fondled several times in a joking manner, seemed to me a veritable masterpiece. <laughs> Owen says, I feel sorry if you have to read this. <laughs> I'm thinking that uh, next week, because the thing is that, like, you know, HP Black Mamba isn't here to like discuss this with me. And I know that he wanted to. So I think I'm thinking that I might, when I leave off here, make a, a note and then start something else next Tuesday. But I have to think about what I want to read. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, let's see. Because I mean, you know, HP Mamba and I can pick this up again later together again. Um, what do you want with such a pretty girl? I asked Dupree for the pleasure you appear to cherish places, no emphasis upon looks. Ah, said he, you don't know all my mysterious little ways. I was absolutely unable to learn more about them. And although I lived for more than a year with D. Accord and was present at every get together, neither Dupree nor Marianne wished to clarify anything to me. And I remained in entire ignorance of their secret intelligences, which of whatever kind they may have been, did not prevent the taste her lover used to satisfy with me from being an authentic and distinct passion worthy in every respect of inclusion in our anthology. Whatever he did with Marianne, I suppose, must have been merely episodic and either has been or certainly will be related at some one of our sessions. All right, well, we're almost to the bottom of the hour. How time flies when you're having fun, right? <laughs> After some rather indecent libertine stunts, some farts, yet a few more little turds or turdlets, we had considerable talk and sounding impieties on the part of the abbot who seemed to locate one of his most perfect lecheries and ungodly conduct and discourse. After all this, everyone put on his clothes again and went off to bed. 
The next morning, as usual, I appeared in Dia Court's room as he was preparing to rise, and neither of us reprimanded the other for our little infidelities of the evening before. He said that, with the exception of myself, he knew of no girl who shitted better than did Marianne. I put several questions to him, asking what she did with a lover who was so admirably self-sufficient, and Diacourt replied that all this was a secret between the two of them, and they had never seemed willing to disclose it. And we, my own lover and I, went on with our usual little tricks. I was not as confined at Diacourt's house as I had been before. I sometimes ventured abroad. He had complete faith, he told me, in my honesty. I could very well see what danger I would be exposing him to were I to impair my health and he left me to my own devices. With what regarded the health in which, most selfishly, he took such a keen interest, I did nothing to betray his trust. But as for the rest, I considered myself free to do just about everything that would earn me any money, and so, being repeatedly solicited by Fournier, who was eager to arrange parties for me at her establishment, I lent my talents to every project wherefrom I was assured an honorable profit. I was no longer one of her crew. I was a young lady kept by a farmer general. Would I have the greatest kindness to give Madame Fournier an hour of my valuable time and pass at her establishment on such and such a day, et cetera, et cetera. You may fancy how well that paid. It was in the course of these brief distractions that I encountered the new shit worshiper I'll discuss next. Just one instant, put in the bishop. I did not want to interrupt you until you reached the end of a chapter. You seem to be at one now. Would you therefore have the kindness to shed some additional light upon two or three essential points in this latest party? When you celebrated the orgies after your interview with Dupree, did the abbot, who until then had been caressing his bardish only, commit acts of infidelity? In a word, did he lay hands on you? Did the others desert their women for the boy? Monseigneur, said Duclos, the abbot never once left his little boy. He scarcely so much as glanced at us, even though we were naked and all but on top of him. But he toyed with Diacourt's asses, sorry, ass and Despre and also de Urville's. He kissed them, sucked them, Diacourt and de Urville ugh, shit it into his mouth. Ew, and he swallowed the better part of each of those two. Oh. But he would not touch the women. The same was not true of the three other friends relative to his youthful bardash. They kissed him, licked his asshole, and Dupree went off alone with him, for I have no idea what exercise. Excellent, said the bishop. <laughs> You observe that you failed to mention everything and that what you have just recounted forms still another passion, since it figures the taste of a man who has other men shit in his mouth and quite mature men at that. That is true, Monseigneur, Duclos admitted. I confess my error, but I'm not sorry for it, because the soiree is drawn to a close and has indeed been overlong. The bell we were about to hear struck would have indicated that I did not have sufficient time to end the story I was preparing to begin. And with your gracious leave, we will postpone it until tomorrow. No one says, gosh, these people, I have no words. I know, I know. I, know. I feel you. And I'm just like, oh. Um, I'm, I'm up to 171 pages here. And there's, let's see, 391. So we're... Um, I think we're almost at halfway, or we are at halfway. Yeah. Kind of like chugging up that hill, and now we're going to start coasting down the other side. <laughs> the bell did indeed ring, and as no one had 
discharge during the sitting, and as every prick was, however, mightily aloft, they only betook themselves to supper after promising to make good their loss at the orgies. But the impetuous duke was never able to postpone important business, and having ordered Sophie to present her buttocks, he had that lovely child shit. And he swallowed her turd for dessert. Oh. <laughs> uh, Owen says, when do you think this book will be finished? Well, I am thinking that um, I might I might just uh, like leave off today and then we're going to set it aside for a few months until HP Black Mamba can come back so that he can be here because I know he really wanted to discuss this book and you know, he's busy right now working on his own book. So yeah, I may just put it aside and start something else, but I have to think about what I want to, you know, what I wanted to, to read. Um, yeah. So um, <clears throat> we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Dersette, the Bishop and Curval all similarly occupied concluded the same operation. The first with Hyacinth, the second with Saladon, the third with Adonis. The last named, having failed to give ample satisfaction, was inscribed in the punishment book. Oh, okay. So, you know, he couldn't shit on demand and he couldn't produce enough shit to make them happy. So now he's going to be punished. <laughs> These people are, are insane. And Curval, swearing like a trooper, revenged himself upon Teresa's ass, which exploded at point-blank range, the most ponderous turd imaginable. Ew. The orgies were eminently libertine, and Dursette, forsaking youthful turds, said that for the evening's games he would have none but what his three old friends could yield him. They humored him with passing fair performance, and the little libertine discharged discharged like a stallion while devouring Kerval shit. <sighs> Night came at last to restore some measure of calm to so much intemperance and to restore as well our libertines' desires and faculties. The 13th day... <clears throat> President, who that night lay with Adelaide, his daughter, ugh, having sported with her until he felt sleep about to claim him, <clears throat> had therewith relegated her to the pallet beside his bed in order that Fun Khan might have her place, for he was ever eager to have the old duenna by his side when lust awoke him, which occurred almost every night toward three in the morning. He opened his eyes with a start and fell to swearing and blaspheming like the true rascal he was. He would at such times be gripped by a, lu a lubric fur, which now and again became dangerous. That is why he was so fond of having that trusty old Fancon near him, for no one was so skillful at calming him, whether by offering herself or by immediately bringing him one of the objects lying in his bedchamber. See, so there it is again, right? They're, they're referring to human beings as objects. You know, I mean, the people that are doing this, um, you know, obviously are, you know, some people that have no empathy, have no feelings for anyone else, but the, what their own stuff is. And therefore, you know, that is to me, that is psychopathic, right? These are psychopaths. Um, On that particular night, the president, instantly recollecting some infamies he had perpetrated upon his daughter just before falling asleep, called for her at once with the intention of repeating them, but she was not there. Imagine the consternation and the commotion created by such an incident. Creval springs from bed in a towering rage, asks where his daughter is. Candles are lit, everybody hunts around, the place is ransacked, Nothing is to be found. The last place searched is the girl's apartments. 
Every bed is examined, and at last, the interesting Adelaide is discovered seated in her nightgown near Sophie's cot. Those two charming girls, united by their similarly tender natures, their piety, virtuous sentiments, candor, and absolutely identical amenity, had been seized by the most beautiful affections for each other, and they were exchanging comforting words, consoling one another for the dreadful fate that had been reserved for them. No one had perceived their commerce until then, but what followed proved that this was not the first time they'd got together, and it was discovered as well that the elder of, the, of them was cultivating the other's finer sentiments and had especially pleaded with her not to stray from her religion and her duties towards God, who would one day comfort and console them for all their woes. I leave it to the reader to picture Kerval's fury and stormy reaction when he located the lovely missionary. He seized her by the hair and, overwhelming her with invectives, all very harsh, dragged her to his chamber where he tied her to his bedpost and left her there until the next morning to ponder over her indiscretion. All of the friends having rushed to the scene, it will also be readily imagined with what haste and decision Kerval had the two delinquents' names written down in the register. The Duke argued passionately in favor of instantaneous correction, and what he proposed was not by any means mild. But the bishop, having count countered with a very reasonable objection to what his brother was urged to do, Dursette was content simply to include them on the agenda. There was no way of attacking the duennas. They were all four bedded in Monsieur's chambers that night. This fact accounted for the imperfect administration of the household and arrangements were made thereby in future. There would always be at least one duenna in the girls' quarters and another in the boys'. Their lordships re retired to bed again and Kerval, whom anger had rendered more than cruelly impudicious did things to his daughter we cannot yet describe, but which, by, per per by pers bleh, precipitating his discharge, at least put him quietly to sleep. <sighs> All hands in the chicken coop had been so terrified that on the morrow, no misbehavior was discovered. And amongst the boys, only Narcisse, whom the evening before Kerval had forbidden to wipe his ass, wishing to have it nicely beshitted at coffee, which this child was scheduled to serve and who had unfortunately forgot his instructions. Only Narcisse, I say, had cleaned his anus and he'd done so with extreme care. It was in vain the little chap explained that his mistake could be repaired since, said he, he wanted to shit there and then. He was told to keep what he had and that he would be nonetheless inscribed in the fatal book, which inscriptions the redoubtable Dursette instantly performed before his eyes, thus to make him sense all the enormity of his fault, a veritable sin and possibly by itself capable of upsetting or, who knows, of preventing Monsieur Le Presidente's discharge. Constance, whom they did not hinder because of her state, the Grange and Bumcleaver were the only ones who were granted chapel permission. Everybody else received the order not to draw the cork until the evening toasts. So what that means is that only those three people were allowed to actually shit if they needed to. Everybody else was told, no, you got to hold it for the evening. <laughs> These people are freaking crazy. Preceding night's events provided the dinner conversation. They made game of the president for permitting the bird to fly from its cage, etc. Some champagne restored his gay spirits and the company sallied forth to coffee. Narcisse, Celadon, and Selmir distributed it. So did Sophie, who was greatly ashamed of herself. She was asked how often the thing had happened. She replied that it had occurred only twice and that Madame de Dursette gave her such good counsel that indeed she thought it was most unjust to punish them both for it. The president assured her that what she called good counsel was in her situation the very worst, that the devotion wherewith Madame de Dursette had been filling her head would serve no purpose save to get her punished every day and that in her present circumstances 
She was to have no masters and no gods save his three confrères and himself. No religion save that of blindly serving and obeying them in everything. And all the while he was delivering this sermon, he had her kneel between his legs and bade her suck his prick. Ugh. Which the poor little thing did all a tremble. As always partisan to thigh fuckery, the Duke obliged as he was to abstain from the capital practice impaled Zelmir in this style. Meanwhile, having the little girl shit in his cupped hand ugh, and gobbling it up as quickly as it was received. And all that while Doucette was inducing Celadon to discharge into his mouth and the bishop was industriously extracting a turd from Narcisse. <sighs> A few minutes no more were set aside for the nap that they found such an aid to digestion than having taken up their posts in the auditorium to close face the gathering and began the day's narrative. It's kind of interesting in a, you know. Hey. Hey there, how are you? Hi, Zane. Uh, Psychic Vampire says, uh, my fuck boys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Owen says, I'm glad I finished my food. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. You know, there's one thing about this, though. Um, how do I say this? I, I, I once, you know, I knew somebody and they had mental health issues. And at one point they actually did eat like some of their own shit. And um, it made them violently sick. And they were sick for like three, four days. So, you know, the amount of like scat bullshit that these people are doing and eating each other's poop and all that. And they're not sick. It's kind of hard to believe, like, you know, that they, that they weren't absolutely sicker than dogs. <sighs> The gallant octogenarian Fournier had in mind for me, messieurs, was an official from the auditing bureau, short, pudgy, and with an extremely unpleasant face. He set a pot between us. We squatted down back to back and shitted simultaneously. He seizes up the pot. Oh, God, I'm going to be sick. With his fingers, stirs the two turds, mixes them, swallows the batter while I promote his discharge. Interruption, which takes place in my mouth. He barely even glanced at my behind, nor did he do any kissing, but his ecstasy was very sharp and compelling all the same. He pranced all around the room, swearing while he gulped and ejaculated and then took himself off, giving me four louis for the strange ceremony. However, my landowner, my landowner became more fond of me with each passing day and more trusting too. And this trust, which I lost no time in abusing, soon became the cause of our eternal separation. One day when he'd left me alone in his library, I noticed that before going out for the day, he'd filled his purse with money taken from a deep drawer entirely filled with gold. Ah, what a capture, I said to myself. And having from that very instant conceived the idea of making off with this sum. I set to watching for the means and opportunity whereby to appropriate it. Diacor never locked the drawer, but he carried with him the key to his library and having it discovered that this door and lock were both very frail, I fancied it would take little effort to break the one and the other. Having adopted the plan, I concentrated upon nothing but taking advantage of the first time Diacor was absent the entire day. That used to be the case twice a week when he went off for private bacchanals in the company of Dupree and the abbot. 
Madame de Grange will perhaps describe what occurred during these outings. They lie beyond my province. The favorable moment was soon at hand. Diocourt's valets, as libertine as their master, never failed to go with him to these parties, and so I found myself almost alone in the house. Full of impatience to put my project into execution, I go straight away to the door of the library, break the thin panel with a blow of my fist, rush to the drawer, find it unlocked, as I knew it would be, I remove everything it contains. My prize amounts to not less than 3,000 louis. I fill my pockets, rifle other drawers. A splendid jewel case catches my eye. I pick it up. But what was I not to find in the other drawers of that bountiful secretary? Fortunate Diacourt, what great good luck for you that your imprudence was not discovered by anyone else but me. The secretary contained enough to have had him broken on the wheel, messieurs, that's all that I can tell you. Quite apart from the transparent and expressive notes addressed to him by Dupree and the abbot pertaining to their secret commerce, there was every kind of furniture needed for the performing of these infamies. Okay, so not only did, did this girl find a whole lot of money, but... Um, sounds to me like she found all kinds of um, sex toys and stuff but more than that she found hard evidence that if perhaps if she'd made it public could have destroyed this guy um, but I halt myself here the boundaries you've prescribed to my deep positions prevent me from saying more de Grange will treat the whole matter as for myself the theft once effected I left it once shuddering to think of all the dangers I'd perhaps been exposing myself to by frequenting, frequenting the company of such scoundrels. Hmm. All right. So hmm. she actually had a moment of uh, clarity there and realized like um, you're consorting with some really bad company. These are criminals. These are, they're not just sick pervs, you know, they're criminals. <laughs> and you know what ends up happening if you you know if you disport yourself with those kinds of people that's you know you're probably going to come to a bad end you know i crossed over to london and and as my sojourn in that city where for six months i dwelt in the most comfortable style offers nothing that could be of any outstanding interest to your lordships you'll permit me to pass quickly over that part of the story. I'd main con maintained contact with no one in Paris but Fournier. However, she advised me of the hue and cry the land, the land owner had raised over this paltry little robbery. Yeah, and um, it's not so much the money. It's, it's the other stuff, the incriminating stuff. I don't believe that uh, this character, this woman... I don't think she actually took it. I think she realized that, uh, you know, her, I mean, the thing is, right, that they've, they've captured the uh, aristocracy, they've captured the judges, so the um, law and order system, um, you know, the, the, the religious system, one of them's a bishop. I forget what the other one is right at the moment, but the point being that um, if you have infiltrated and corrupted the highest courts in the land do you really think you're going to get a fair trial do you really think that that something that is not going to be good for these people to have come to light is somehow going to make it into the light probably not especially because she's nothing but you know a whore right she's a whore and and in the society you know it's funny like in this society when this book was written i mean <sighs> Yes, on the one hand, you know, I think that they, the rich nobles and so on, I mean, yeah, of course, you know, there's horrors, it's just a fact of life, and they, they employ them or whatnot. But on the other hand, um, the classes were much more rigid than they are today, and somebody like that would be totally looked down on, and their word would be highly suspect, especially when um, you're placing it against, like, a wealthy merchant like this character actually was um 
you know, it's not going to fly. Like, I, I don't know. So anyway, she, I don't think she was stupid enough to take that kind of stuff and try to expose it because it would have, they would have killed her for that for sure. So, you know, she just stole like what for them was pocket change. For her, it was money that she could keep herself in style and uh, exist on for like up to six months, but then the money runs out, right? And you're right back in the gutter where you started. I think the smarter thing to do would have been to take that money and try to start something to grow it, you know, like maybe a small business or something. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyways. However, she advised me, I think it's, um, you know, it's spring here, right? And I, the pollen and whatever, it's making me um, sneezy. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. Okay. However, she advised me of the hue and cry the landowner had raised over this paltry little robbery. Yeah, I mean, for these people, you know, 3,000 louis is nothing. It's half a year's wages to somebody that doesn't have anything. But for them, that's nothing, <laughs> you know. So, when I finally resolved to put an end to this blathering, I took up pen and paper and very coolly informed him that she, who had happened upon his money, had also discovered other things. Ooh. And that if he were determined to continue to search for the culprit, I would, as bravely as possible, endure my fate and very certainly depose with the same judge who had questioned me upon what I'd done with the contents of the small drawers a detailed statement of what I'd found in the larger ones. Not a good idea. <laughs> Not very smart. Owen says, yeah, the pollen count is high here too. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty high right now, I guess. I never, I never was affected by it before. Like this is something new, you know, um, just in the last few years, like, Our man fell as silent as a tomb, and as six months later, their three-party debauchery came broadly to light. And as they themselves left France for security abroad, I returned to Paris. And, must I avow my misbehavior, I returned, monsieur, as poor as I'd been before dispossessing Diacourt. And such were my straits, I was obliged to put myself back in Madame Fournier's self safekeeping. As I was no more than 23 at the time, I did not want for adventures. I'm going to ignore those exterior to my domain and recount with your lordship's indulgent permission only the ones therein. I know now that you take some interest. Um, I would say that, that that girl was very, very lucky that they didn't just silence her because that's more like how people like that operate, right? Um. I'm kind of scanning here. <laughs> We're almost out of time. We're actually almost to the top of the hour, but I'm just scanning to see. Uh, yeah, no, I guess I'll have to read a little bit more. <laughs> I'm just wondering because, you know, I'm surprised that they let her live and that they left town in order to um, escape the scandal kind of thing. I'm surprised that they didn't just offer, you know, because to them, um, everybody else, especially these lower classes, I mean, um, to them, these people are garbage. They're trash. They're just trash, you know, so it'd be nothing for them. Uh, Owen says, I didn't know what to say today on this book. <laughs> Laugh out loud. Yeah, no. Um, I mean, it is an interesting look at, you know, the kind of sick bullshit that that these people get up to, I guess, behind closed doors and um, just, you know, it's also talking about corruption in high places, right? Um, you know, these people are extremely corrupt and, and they, uh, they work hand in glove. So on the surface, they appear like they're separate, um, but under the covers, they're all like shaking hands, you know, doing the secret hand society handshake and, um, they all know, right? And um, they do these, they do these like gestures and stuff. They do stuff and it's out in front of the dummies, right? The normies who don't have a clue about what's going on. It's like a, it's like a society hidden within a larger society, right? Yeah. 
Anyway, that's corruption for you. So uh, let's see, we are almost at the top of the hour, so I'm going to leave off there. That's on page 175. I might pick it up one more time next week. I don't know. We'll see. We'll find out on Tuesday if it's going to be something new or if I'll continue a little bit. I'm just seriously wondering, like, why this person wasn't just offed, because I think that would have been more in line with, you know, I'm surprised, actually. <laughs> Owen's saying, I can't wait for the Greek mythology book. Yeah, so let's see. Today's Tuesday, so tomorrow I'm going to continue uh, with this um, thing that I'm reading, which is a CIA document. Um, very interesting. So we're going to continue with that. And uh, then on Thursday, we'll continue with the Celtic mythology and the history of the Celts in Ireland. And... Um, and then perhaps Friday, I'm going to have to take a stab at doing the tarot read. And we'll see how that goes. <laughs> it's going to be a bit harder because there's nobody looking after the lineup. But uh, yeah, I can't wait three months for that. You know, it's already been a few weeks. Um, so yeah, let's let's give it a shot this week. All right. So yeah. Um, Owen, thank you so much for being here today. I really, really appreciate it. I do. And thank you, Zane, for popping in. It was nice to see you. Hopefully, we'll see you really soon. I'm definitely looking forward to tomorrow, actually. It's a really interesting doc, and I think it's an interesting chat. So I hope that you will join me tomorrow. Um, and until then, have a really good day. And yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say goodbye for now, and we'll see you really soon. So yeah, bye guys. Have a good one.